Hello and welcome to Insight, the program where we talk to the leaders and key influencers in the aerospace, aviation and defence industries across the emerging markets. Today, we're joined on the program from a man by Kamil Al Awadi, who has just taken up the hot seat for the Airline Industry Association IATA as the Regional Vice President for Africa and the Middle East. Kamil, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Alan. It's great to have you. Now, IATA, with its new CEO in Willie Walsh as well, is going to be very much focused on recovery and return to business. Now, you know exactly what the airlines are going through, having been CEO of Kuwait Airways when the pandemic began. I don't think um, pre-COVID any airline was ever prepared for this sort of, this sort of level of uh, impact on aviation. And, uh, and I was in charge of an airline uh, and Kuwait took uh, action very early. So, so, so uh, I was responsible for activating the emergency response center on the 22nd of Feb. And uh, Kuwait then subsequently locked down completely on the 8th of March. So it was one of the first countries. And we had nothing, no, no references, documents, or standard, standard operating procedures to go back to. So we had to create our own. And, and, and if you can go back into history and look at some of the pictures, we had you know, we had our crew operating at the end of Feb in these white suits from head to toe, and they looked like they were doing, you know, space walks. Um, and uh, because nobody knew, of course, uh, what COVID was and, and how, how infectious it was. And so, so it was a horrendous time. And then once you go past the initial virus and protecting your crew and trying to bring the passengers back and so on and so forth, you go into the next phase and you try to look at, you know, business resilience and, and uh, survivability, really. And, and, and it was a change of mindset once again and the emergency response team there all activated for a different approach, for a different issue completely. And I, I you know, I don't envy any, any CEO and any airline at that time uh, and, and how to handle this, because nobody's ever prepared for something. So let's talk about how you ended up leading the flag carrier for Kuwait. Tell us about your background. Um, so I've, I've, you know, I've always tinkered with electronics and, and cars and machineries and mechanical aspects ever since I was in, in my teens. And, uh, and aviation was the ultimate of, of avionics and electronics and mechanics and engines and so on. And when I, I saw an opportunity, an ad in the newspaper saying that, you know, we're looking for people that we will qualify to be engineers, I, I jumped at it. So when you maintain an aircraft and, and you fix a defect or something, you see the results instantaneously. So you get that joy instantaneously. It's not like when you plan next year's budget and, you know, and work 12 months to see if you achieve it or not. It's a completely different field. And, uh, and that's what got me into, into aviation. But, but after a while, um, you know, I started saying, OK, I need to know more from that. And, and uh, I got into a department where the safety department, where I was involved with all the production uh, aspects of, an, uh, of the airline, the operational part of the airline. And uh, I did that for a few years, got very comfortable understanding what pilots do, engineers do, ground handling, cargo security, um, cabin crew, and so on. And that sort of covered all the ground handling. And I did my master's in aerospace, where I was exposed to the commercial end, the finance end, the aviation industry. So uh, the one thing that I tell you from, from my 32 years is you, you never actually know all aspects of, of aviation. It's such a massive industry that no matter how much you think you know, you realize that you really don't know that much. So going back to COVID, why is it the Middle East and Africa seem to be the hardest hit? I, I, so, so I like what Willie Walsh said uh, a while back. He said it wasn't the airlines that stopped flying, it was the governments and, and authorities within, within each state. My personal take on this is yes, uh, the AMI region, uh, the Middle East and Africa region, got hit harder. I think it was, it was a simple reaction by individual states without consulting anybody else, taking, taking uh, decisions out of fear for their population. So, so a state in this region would make a decision 
uh, out of fear for the safety of their, their uh, population. And, and the consequence is a massive damage to the aviation industry. And, and in fact, uh, there are a large number of countries that's completely locked down. So there's no, no flights at all. You have to consider that airlines are, are, are cutting costs tremendously. And that was, that was one of the things I started doing in May of last year. Um, and of course, you know, the, the quickest solution is to lay off staff. Uh, and that's un unfortunate. But there are, you know, improving efficiencies and so on and so forth. And one of the things that you have in front of you day in, day out, is how much cash you have left. Uh, of course, this, this pandemic also uh, caused mistrust with your handling agents and companies and so on. So, so a lot of companies started asking for cash up front before you operate to them because they needed the cash too. And there was none of this IATA clearing house or, you know, we'll send you the bill in the end of the month. So that means that if, as an airline, you needed to have that cash in your hand. And, and subsequently to that, you would not operate um, a flight if you're going to lose on it. That was it, because you can't afford to do it anymore. So it's tough knowing what routes to operate, and it all changes so quickly. Airlines generally are planning three to five years ahead of time with their equipment and where their growth is and so on and so forth. This is, this is a new experience. This is like a startup airline with all the costs added in the start. Um, it's uh, uh, you know, my from a, from a CEO's point of view and not any other point of view, I was frustrated at, at governments not talking. And so now, I, if I put my Ayata hat on and, and skip the, the CEO, I am I'm still I'm still bleeding from my experience in in uh, as a CEO. So I take that experience in now, and I want to use it to, to avoid avoid airlines suffering. Uh, even further because of the disconnects that are happening within a state and between states. And that's uh, my, my focal, yeah, focal point there. I need to get the states to accept uh, a standard that gets applied between all the states. There's no point, you know, a flight is from A to B. If A is sorted out and B isn't, that flight's not going to happen. Well, a lot of this seems to be about consistency, and I guess that's why IATA and ICAO are pushing for a common international standard. The only way you're going to get everybody on board is when we have a standard, which ICAO did, um, uh, with, of course, working with uh, the organizations such as IATA and WHO and so on. Having everybody on the same platform first, then, then airlines can, can work. And the disconnect remains massive. Uh, within the, the, this region, okay, EU is moving towards a unified process, but the disconnect remains massive. And getting my my top priority now is getting uh, the stakeholders in this in each state to first of all meet internally and accept uh, a, a standard that will be applied within the region and hopefully, uh, you know, globally. And the IATA travel pass is coming. How do you see that working? The, the app is being tested, okay? So it's just not available for you to download right now, but it's being tested. Um, and it's being tested quite well. Of course, you know, every time you get a glitch, then you go back and you, you, you sort it out. So it was tested several times. So the app is a way to, you know, the, the means to an end. Um, it's what I noticed in my last two weeks of travel is that, I would have to download an app every for every destination I was going, and this is getting confusing. And in fact, I actually spent an hour in in one airport going back to Kuwait, sorting out all these apps and and the stuff that they needed, and so on and so forth. So, moving forward, um, the Air to Travel Pass has uh, been received really well with our member airlines and even non-member airlines. Um, there's a massive queue, so we're, you know there's a certain bandwidth that that, that uh, IATA can handle at any one time. So first come, first serve, almost. Um, there's a massive queue of airlines waiting to to apply this. The app, uh, we would like the app to be embedded into their own reservation system. Uh, doesn't have to be a standalone app at all, um, and it would simplify travel, uh, you know, tremendously. 
Now, Camille, I understand one of your other big tasks is resolving the issue of blocked funds and the impact that is having on African aviation. Well, it's, uh, it's a very good question, Alan. It's, it's very worrying. And, and so now I'm going to wear both hats again. When, uh, when, when COVID hit us and we were consuming cash, we we're literally burning it day in. You, you can calculate, every airline can calculate per minute while it's on ground. And uh, so, so the first immediate thing as the person in charge of an airline is to look for all your money, bring it in from the, all the outstations, because every airline uh, have bank accounts in the outstations where, where all your money goes, you know, in sales. And stuff. So you're bringing it in and, and you're looking for rents and leases and stuff like that to drop because you, you need to hold cash. You literally need to hold cash. With the block funds in Africa, it's a big number. And, and airlines uh, are, are very strapped for cash right now. And it's day in, day out, it gets worse. And uh, these, these block funds are owed to airlines and member airlines and non-member airlines, but predominantly member airlines who are suffering. And, and you know, they, so I'll give you an example, whether it's true or not is irrelevant. An airline may go to a bank and take a loan with a high interest at this stage for cash, yet they actually have cash being locked up in, in a state in Africa. Okay, so they end up paying interest on the cash that they already have in Africa. These funds, there's no excuse for, for blocking the funds. I think, I think uh, the African states should really consider releasing these funds because it can affect their own airlines. Uh, and, and also it affects the airlines that were operating into their states, which means they may cause an airline that was actually a lifeline for their own state to go out of business, and then they lose that lifeline into the state. So I think Af African states should consider unblocking these funds uh, you know, with urgency. Well, thanks, Camille. You certainly are having to hit the ground running with all of those challenges. Good luck. Mm -hmm.